County, welcome to this edition of City Spotlight. This month, we're at 4700 Grand Avenue at the Des Moines Arts Center. And we're here to celebrate Black History. Today we'll speak with Betty Andrews, Executive Director of I'll Make Me a World in Iowa. Then we'll visit with Associate Professor of Art and Design at Iowa State University, Brenda Jones, in the exhibit of Henry Tanner, a distinguished African-American painter who paved the way for artistic social change. We'll wrap things up with opinions of some local familiar faces on what Black History Month means to them. Hope you'll enjoy this show. We think it's great. Stick with us. Welcome back. I'm here with Betty Andrews, who's responsible for our Make Me a World of Vision and making it come to life. Betty, how are you? Welcome to I'm City Spotlight. Great. Thank you so much, and thanks for joining us at the I'll Make Me a World in Iowa Gala. Oh, proud to be here. here. Absolutely. Great. Tell us a little bit about your vision and how you made this come true. <laughs> well, actually, it's not just my vision. It is the vision of a community. And um, the way this whole thing bega um, began was in 1999, about 20 different collaborating agencies and organizations came together in answer to a national challenge challenge to produce some programming around a documentary that was going to be released in, about African American arts and culture. And that program was called I'll Make Me a World. Well, Iowa, being the great state that we are, we took up the, channel, uh, the challenge and we took it up very strongly. Um, and we came up with a program uh, called I'll Make Me a World in Iowa. And what we did with that was put together all types of arts and culture and a day-long celebration. We included soul food. And so what we found out that first year in 1999 is that um, we fulfilled a niche. And since then, the festival has grown. We began, we're thinking we were going to have 300 people. We ended up with 1,000 that first year. And now the festival, um, every year, 15 to 20,000 people attend. Talk to us about the different places. Where did you start out? What was the first place that you did it? <laughs> we started out the, at the, a very great venue. We started out at the Iowa Historical Building. And um, uh, the reason why we started out at the State Historical Building was that um, Patton's exhibit, and that was an exhibit um, from a printer who was on Center Street in um, Des Moines. And if anyone knows about Center Street, it was a street where a lot of African Americans um, lived and um, did business and stuff like that. So this printer had a lot of information and that information has been archived at the State Historical Building. So that was kind of our centerpiece for I'll Make Me a World in Iowa. And um, we started there. Um, we got so big there that we had to move. And so we are currently at the uh, uh, Polk County Convention Complex for the festival. Um, but also our gala started out at uh, Terrace Hill. And we have moved, uh, you know, it around, kind of keeping it fresh and everything. And so this year we're at the uh, Des Moines Art Center. Now, is the gala expanded also? I mean, you started out probably with a little smaller group, and uh, it did. It did. We, which is why we had to move from the governor's mansion. Um, we, it has expanded and expanded a great deal. And um, great venue, but not quite the right, space. Right, right. Yeah. But see, yeah. the good thing is that we still have the support of the governor's office, and sure. so um, he'll be at the celebration. And um, I know that his um, uh, there are some people that are participating, so we're really excited about that. Well. So. So let's talk about it, because you and I have done this uh, for a <laughs> yes, number of years, but absolutely. let's talk about the different things that they can experience while, they're, while we're doing this. So we get we get a little culture, we get a little art, we get absolutely. a little food, I and mean, let's talk about some of well, that. Well, okay, well we're at the gala tonight, and so, we, like I said, we'll soul food orders, we'll have wine and a number of other things, and we're here at the Art Center featuring the Tanner exhibit, exhibit I'm sorry, the Henry Osawa Tanner exhibit, and um, from there, next week, we'll be at the festival, at Iowa's African American Festival, and during that festival, you'll see a lot of things. We have two stages of Iowa performers. We have um, Ruben Stutter, American Idol, Idol winner, um, I think season two. 
he's going to be with us and he's going to give us a free concert. Um, there are a number of other things, including, as I mentioned, soul food. And this is just, you know, soul food. We'll have a ton of vendors. We'll have art exhibits and we'll have, uh, we'll have a bike show. The Black Bikers Association will be there. We'll have a kids carnival. And I know it's January, get going into February, because we kick off Black History Month. But we'll have snow cones. We'll have popcorn. Um, lots of fun things for the kids. So it's going to be great. Let's quickly let people know, if they want to find out more information sure. about I'll Make Me a World in Iowa, where will they look? Do they have a phone number? Do you have a Absolutely. website? Let's, let's tell people well, how they can get more information. The great thing is we just relaunched our website, and it is awesome. So that address is worldiniowa.org. So worldiniowa.org. And so if you go to that website, you'll be able to find all about, out, out, all about I'll Make Me a World in Iowa. And then it, you can also call us at 288-7171. That's our uh, phone number. So oh, that'll be anything great. you need to know. Betty, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, man. Best of luck to you, and let's do it again next thank year. Thank you. We'll do. We'll all do. Right. Thanks so Thanks, much. Betty. We're going to take a little break and look at the community calendar, and then we'll be right back, and this time we'll be with Associate Professor Brenda Jones of Iowa State University. Joining me now is Iowa State University Associate Professor of Art and Design, Brenda Jones. Brenda, welcome to City Spotlight. Thank you. Talk to us a little bit about your interest in art and how you struck up being a professor at Iowa State University. Well, actually, the first time I was introduced to paintings was through my father. And he introduced me to Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. My art teacher introduced me to Tanner, Mrs. Powell, the late Mrs. Powell. She introduced me to Tanner, Mentis, uh, oh gosh, Kandinsky, a whole group of artists, including uh, Augusta Savage, who's an African-American painter, Charles White. And this is a whole group of artists that just no one really understood. And you have another group of artists that's right before Tanner that was very important to him as well as to me. So there's just a very small little window of African Americans, but you have to put them in the in that sequence of events. And actually, Tanner's life is a lot like mine, believe it or not. My father was a minister, Church of God in Christ minister, but my dad died a couple of years ago. And I went to Rome to study because it was important to me to do that. And I'm taking students to Rome out of the College of Design. Uh, we've been doing that for almost 15 years now. And we go for a semester, so everything has that overlapping, and it's very important. I try to bring that back to the classroom. Now let me ask you, do you still paint yourself? Oh, yes. I mean, you're, so you're yes. avid into that. Almost. Now, let me ask you, there's a lot of people that are artists, mm -hmm. and we find them around in Des Moines, who can't, don't seem to be able to mix the classroom and painting. It seems like they're, they seem like they're at cross purposes, or do you feel it's more stimulating? I mean, how do you, how do you feel about working well, your art and actually, I tell students people. you get a job to support your work. Okay. First of all, and you, if they're at a university, we have advisors there that should help them know what courses to take, so they can do just that. Because the art cannot be something that you just make to make money off of. Not in the fine arts. Right. We do have graphic design, interior design. We have other arts there, 
But in the fine arts, it has to be an evolution of events that's going to occur in their life. Things that they'll have to really dig in and work. And they have to have a passion. So, of course, we won't have that many people that uh, will come out as painters or as sculptors, but the students that will go through those classrooms will have critical thinking uh, techniques. They'll know and be able to understand things that most people will only see it logical. Does some of their passion stimulate you to do oh, some God, different yes, things? Yes, I love it. Actually, I, I, the idea to give back the things that I've learned. And I learn from them as well as they learn from me. So it's been, it's been a wonderful adventure. Let's talk a little bit about your study of Tanner. Well, I started looking at Tanner years ago because I love the banjo player. But I also love the idea of the, the religious pieces that he did. And I, I, you know, it's really quite interesting because uh, Lois Maylou Jones is another artist that went to Europe, and she loved Paris also. And it, these are periods of history, because I helped integrate things when I was growing up, and these are periods of history that was very, very difficult for those artists. Tanner, at the age of 13, became an artist in his mind. He decided this is what he wanted to do, and he started to, it was, it was a done deal. And sort of like you, right? Yeah, well, actually, I started about seven. Okay. The first time I saw Michelangelo's uh, Madonna in Christ. Okay. I think when you look at that and think about what was given back to this country and what was eliminated, because for a long time he couldn't do anything. I mean, for years he was sort of stuck. And uh, there was a bishop at Clark University that helped him. Him and this man and his wife uh, commissioned him to do a portrait. And from that portrait, he had a major show. From that major show, he ended up going to Paris because they brought off the whole entire show, gave him $300, which you and I both know was a lot of money back in those back days. Back then, yeah. And so he fell in love. This man was in the salon. He, you know, he never stopped creating, but he had Thomas Eakins with him, who was an American artist in Philadelphia. But he also integrated that program, too. So all of that just, it was an amazing thing. Because I remember growing up, and most of the students that, uh, when I went to college, had no idea who these people were. And that's an amazing thing to me, too. You've done a lot of research yes. uh, into probably not only Tanner, but do uh, you feel like that, that research, talk to us a little bit about how research helps you with your, not only your passion, your own art, but maybe how it helps you in the classroom as well. Well, it's a little bit like what I would tell students, they need as much art history as possible, and as much history as possible. The reason for that, because you'll end up pleasurizing yourself if you're not careful. You'll start doing things thinking it's brand new when it's not, especially with our technology now, quick gratification. So it is extremely important that they dig a little bit deeper. If you're going to look at Tanner, find out who this man studied with and who he looked at and find out about his subject matter, vice versa. If you're going to study uh, any artist, mentees, find out who mentees looked at. You can't just stop. You have to keep reaching to, so that you have an understanding. And then you go back to the table, and you come up with subject matter. And then you find all of those forms to work with yours. And it works. It's just a formula that works. As you researched Tanner, mm -hmm. uh, what did you feel? I mean, we've got a great uh, display here mm -hmm. at, the, at the Art Center. But are there some common themes that go through uh, a lot of his work? And how do you find, what are those based on? Well, I think... Uh, for me, I think it's probably portraits, religious symbolism, biblical images he used, but also landscape, cityscapes, because this guy really did uh, love the idea of the land. You remember there's a lot of different groups in Philadelphia, the Rhode Island schools, a lot of groups at that period of history. So I can see, even the usage of color, you can see he's looking at impressionistic, uh, almost an oddity of that mark, because these are not as dark as Edmund's work would be. But they're very beautiful pieces. But that's the common thing. The usage of color is common running throughout his pieces. The naturalness of it. So you have all of that here with his work. And the mark. But he, he can really deal with composition beautifully. Do you feel like uh, his work uh, did or had some impact on race relations? I think, like everything, it's a start. And I think because when he went to Paris, when he came back, they actually, before he went, he wasn't accepted as most artists. But there was another artist before him that would probably be the most famous at that moment. But when he came back from Paris, he received uh, one of the most important awards, uh, that Legion Award. He was accepted as a major player. He even uh, was given the associate um, interest membership into 
what was that, into the uh, American design, okay. which is a very prestigious award to have. But he also was awarded uh, and got his work into the Louvre, which only four or five Americans, period, has ever done that. So that gives you an idea how important this man is. So to bring that back to young artists, that because art is a passion. It isn't something that you can take away. It's something that you love. And you want to know more. And so to have that and have someone to say, okay, look at this work. This is just incredible. And doing the Harlem Renaissance, you can't even begin to imagine. Now, where was, he, fr where was he from? Uh, he grew up in, uh, I think he started off in Pittsburgh, and then he ended up in Philadelphia. So he ended up in Philadelphia. His father moved there. And um, he went to Atlanta at one time, opened up a little shop. That didn't work. And I think he loved Paris more than anything. Because no. at that time, he didn't have to fight as much bigotry as he would, even in his art, no matter how good he was. And you can roll that back to even the late 50s with uh, Lois Bay Lou Jones, who integrated Boston University. And she had to start signing her name with initials, because as soon as they realized she was a woman, she couldn't, she couldn't get into exhibitions. Here we are tonight, yes. the gala. I'll make me a world in Iowa. We're kicking off mm -hmm. uh, here shortly, Black History yes. Month. What contribution do you think Tanner made to uh, black history in the United States, if not the world? I think he showed the world that forget about color, that intellect and knowledge and a passion to create has no boundaries. He broke those boundaries. And it's a constant breaking of boundaries. But he was one of the first to break it. And that contribution cannot be denied. I, mean, I doubt if I would be standing here with you. Well, let me ask you, uh, as you work with your students at Iowa State in the classroom and you think about your own work, yes. how, do you, how do you feel, uh, here we are 2011 already, and thinking about five or ten years from now, how do you feel like uh, you're moving in your art and where are your students going here in the 21st century? Well, I'm actually, I'm planning on writing a book pretty soon about that. Um, I'm looking at it in this manner. I think that we will have, well, we have actually, I would say, some incredible young artists that have already become very successful. I could actually name several mm -hmm. to tell you right off the bat. Painters, sculptors, ceramics, jewelry makers. These guys have done a prolific job, and they're very successful. But they had to balance their world, and they had to take responsibility. So you don't go in debt and credit cards. You don't do certain things. And we talk about that to each other, but the main ingredient is to do the art and not stop. Find what you feel. Get that inner self there, and then just do it. Uh, I try to help, because after undergraduate, if they could just have another couple of years in grad school or more, just to keep balancing that, and they're ready for the world. It's never going to, I mean, no job is really that, well, you know that, and easy, a simple thing. But if you have the love of it and the passion of it, you'll make it happen. You'll find a way to make it happen. And for all of our listeners, let's talk just oh, for I a second about <laughs> what we do for the future. Because I kind of feel like life is a lifelong learning process. Mm -hmm. I mean, it some is. people like to know what they know and just work with that. But I think, especially for artists, don't no, you? No, they that have to constantly gotta... read. They have to constantly dig. They need to get out. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have the wrong program. The students can go into Italy. And uh, they go to different spots around Rome to look at different art, into Milan, into Florence, to different places. And then they can go to Switzerland, they can go to uh, Vitro. A lot of different places that enhances what they know. And I think it works wonderfully. And, you know, we have critics from all over the place to come in and to talk to them, people that are actually making a lot of art. And right now in Europe, I can talk about this honestly, because I'm looking at groups of people merging into these cultures now because they need it because of technology. They need more. How do we maintain that edge? And it has to come from the individual. It cannot come from the machine. We have to feed the machine. And so the students are told this and they know they have to do it. And we're always still open. I don't know a faculty member in the College of Design that would not open their door for a student, an alumnus, a student anytime they need it. Now I'm going to ask you a question that's a little off the wall, but let's say any of us that mm -hmm. wanted that we weren't full-time students at Iowa State, mm -hmm. but we wanted to get into your class and, and find out what's going on. You enroll today. You can. I've yes. had people. I've had professors, chairs of department. I didn't know who they were at yeah. the time, and I would make them critique. 
And then I would go to a dinner party and they would stand there and say, you know, this is the hardest teacher I've ever... But yes, we opened the door. And it's, it's very important, um, especially in ISA. Our area is really... Because the more you know creatively, the more you understand how to see outside of this little narrow viewpoint sometimes, it's so worth it for our kids. It's just... You couldn't give enough of that. So yeah, you can take class from me. Oh, I'd love to do it. <laughs> Brenda, thanks for spending time with us on City Spotlight. This Thank is you. great. And uh, good luck at Iowa State. Another 25 years, right? Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Thank yes, you. Thank you. With me now is Judge Odell McGee. Odell, let's talk about what does Black History Month mean to you? Well, you know, Black History means a tremendous amount to, uh, I think, uh, myself and my family and as well. I think a lot of people in this community, it's a great opportunity for the community to concentrate on the contributions of African Americans. And I uh, like to contribute, uh, concentrate on not only their contributions, but specifically the contributions of African Americans in the state of Iowa. Well, it's a good opportunity to look at what they've done, what they've accomplished, and, and to bring that to the forefront. Now, of course, you do understand that every day should be African American History Day because I think the contributions of African Americans are, are just overwhelming if you would look and see what they have done. But this time of the year, it gives us an opportunity to concentrate on those specific things that might otherwise go unnoticed by uh, many of the individuals who uh, are in charge of preparing history and so on and so forth. But it's, it's a great opportunity to go back and to see where I, as an African American, has come from personally. And also to understand, uh, my son and I, for example, have spent the last few days concentrating on famous African Americans and what their contributions are to Ash and Thurgood Marshall and you know, Benjamin Banneker. And, and to a certain extent, even uh, Henry Tanner, the artist that uh, has been featured in the exhibit. It's a good opportunity for me to sit down with him and talk to him about what he could do and how he could do some things for himself and how he cannot allow himself to be stopped by, you know, the mere fact that he has a uh, dark skin color. He still can do great things. And so it's a good opportunity to concentrate on the community, to concentrate on the family, and also to concentrate on myself. That's terrific. Thanks for that. Thank you. With me now is Elaine Estes. Elaine, what does Black History Month mean to you? Well, I think it's remarkable that Carter G. Woodson created uh, this idea almost 100 years ago and that it's still having effect on people and people have learning experiences and they have visual experiences as well as discussions. And so history continues to live and be celebrated. And of all, Thank you, Lynn. All right, our next guest is William Morris. Tell me uh, what, what Black History Month means to you. Black History Month is a celebration of a unique and an incredibly talented people. African Americans came here from, most of them came in chains in 1609 and have excelled in every field of human endeavor. We have built this nation from Benjamin Banneker, who surveyed Washington, D.C., to uh, Buffalo soldiers in the West, to uh, judges, black elected judges in California as early as 1873. Uh, vice President Hannibal Hamlin was a mixed race man. He was Abraham Lincoln's first vice president, he was mixed race. And uh, just an extraordinary legacy of accomplishment in medicine and law and business and politics and sports. We have fundamentally changed the scenery in America and in Iowa. Iowa has a very rich and a very large African American history tradition going back to before statehood. Uh, as, you, as you well know, the Iowa Supreme Court desegregated Iowa schools in 1868. Uh, the Iowa legislature took the white only language out of the state constitution in 1884. Of course, we had the black officers camp at Fort Des Moines in 1917. And, uh, Iowa has been a revolutionary in many respects in African American history. Uh, we seated our first black legislator back in the early, uh, late 1950s, early 1960s, and uh, it has been a record of accomplishment, really, that's like no other state in the Union. I have black Americans that visit me from all over the country. They are astounded at the level uh, and sophistication of African American history in this state. Outside in that was published uh, several years ago by the State Historical Society. Dr. Chase is here from DMAC. Uh, that puts to shame any 
state in the union that has published anything about the history of its African Americans, that book puts everybody to shame. And I'm proud of this state. I'm proud of its history and its record, and that's why I'm still here. So that's what Black, Black History Book means to me. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Our next guest is Dr. Hal Chase. Hal, thanks for taking a moment. Tell us about Black History and what it means to you. Right. It's, first of all, it's an opportunity here in Iowa, as well as the nation, to celebrate the achievements and the relationship between so-called black and white, which is the way I would define African American history, frankly. It's an inseparable intertwined and intimate relationship between the so-called black and white. We don't have to recognize, if you will, the negative aspects of that relationship. And admit them, if you will, so that we might move forward. Thank you. With me now is Akeel Abdul Samad, minority leader on the up in the House of Representatives House in the state of Iowa. Yes. Let's talk about black history and what that means to you. Well, black history means a chance for us to share, and it gives us a chance to see differences. Because once you identify the differences, there, as you know, then your things that you have in common have substance. But if you don't know the differences, then how does your similarities have substance? And this gives us a chance to learn that. Thank you. You're welcome. Isaiah McGee, yes. Human Rights Director for the State of Iowa. Yes. Correct? Yes. Uh, you just got appointed. Yes. And uh, let's talk about black history and what you're going to do in the Human Rights Department right here in the yeah, State of Iowa. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think uh, you know, one of the exciting things about black history is just the, it's the recognition from the United States that there is a, a, a special place uh, that needs to be recognized about the, the contributions that, that African Americans have, have had um, in American history. Uh, and, and I think people are surprised, actually, uh, when, they, when they study and they learn more about black history, about just how involved uh, the African American people have been through all parts of history uh, and, and all kind of components of it as well. Uh, and so I think that's uh, an important recognition of something that we should, should celebrate. Uh, in the Department of Human Rights, it's one of the things that we're excited about is also looking at what are some different ways that, that, that we can get underrepresented Iowans, uh, African Americans, Latinos, Asians, disabled women, and whoever, uh, get them more involved uh, into, in, into uh, aspects of, of Iowa society. Uh, so we're really looking forward, uh, particularly looking at the governor's goals uh, of trying to uh, increase personal income and trying to create jobs and look at what we can do to try to get more folks involved in those jobs, to create these jobs, uh, and to have a level of success here in Iowa. Thanks for coming with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next with us is Mark Harding from Iowa State University. Mark, thank you for taking a moment. Well, it's a privilege to Talk about here. your connection to black history. Well, I have the privilege of representing Iowa State University. And Iowa State University has a, a long uh, tradition in history, actually, with the I'm Making a World celebration. But uh, frankly, going back to George Washington Carver, who is, I, I don't think anyone would argue, is Iowa State University's most famous alum. Uh, he received his bachelor's and his master's degree at Iowa State University before moving on to Tuskegee. So we thought uh, many years ago, when I'll Make Me a World in Iowa was starting up, that we should really be a part of this celebration, that it's a natural fit. Because with George Washington Carver, we're connected to black history you know, for going, going way, way back. So the bottom line is, with particularly George Washington Carver as the connector and the work with Pioneer that he did with Pioneer, and now with I'll Make New World in Des Moines, it gives Iowa State University an opportunity to represent all colleges and universities in promoting educational opportunities for our youth in Iowa. We uh, co-sponsor um, Education Day, which is next Friday, right before Celebration Day. And we have 750 students from all around Iowa who are learning about their heritage, culture, but more importantly, educational opportunities. We're promoting higher education in the state of Iowa. So it, it's, a, it's a great fit for Iowa State University. That's fabulous. Thanks. That wraps up this edition of City Spotlight. I'm Mayor Frank County. I uh, hope that you'll take the time to see our replays on the times and the days uh, that you'll see on your screen. Until next time, this is City Spotlight. Thanks for being with us.